All right. I will be talking about uh, passing APL for static analysis. Uh, this is in context of work I've been doing for SimCorp for our static analysis tool. Um, so, yep, short outline for the talk, sort of start out with some uh, background and motivation. What is this about? What's the uh, setting? Why are we doing this? Uh, then I'll introduce uh, variable types, something that we don't have natively in APL. We have it in many other languages, but uh, we're introducing them. Then talk about the static analysis tool that I've been doing. Um, and that's a rather large piece of software, so there are many aspects to it. But uh, I will dive into sort of the parsing aspect and how, how that works. Um, kind inference is part of that. And then I will show you how, how sort of at the parsing step, how that looks in a, how, how you can do a BNF grammar for APL. So yeah, let's get to it. Uh, SimCorp is a rather large company. Uh, if you were talking to the CEO of SimCorp, he would probably talk something about uh, numbers in terms of uh, revenue and so on. Uh, we're developers, so we talk in size of company in terms of how many functions do we have, how much line of code. So uh, we have several code bases in different languages. Our APL code base, 68,000 functions, uh, roughly. Uh, 1.7 million lines of code. So, uh, and I asked some of my colleagues sort of how many APL developers do we have? And then, well, we also use a source, uh, source control uh, system. So that was just easy sort of uh, get distinct number of developers, unique count plus reduce, right? Uh, uh, so we have, I think, within the last year, 215 distinct uh, persons committing code in, uh, into the APL repository. There's the 68,000 functions, that's, uh, that's pure business code that's running at customers. We have more for utilities and so on. So uh, earlier today, we heard some, something about uh, maintainability, quality. So... This is sort of what do we do in order to keep this huge pile of code maintainable, right? Because this, is, uh, this, this all goes together in one piece of software. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, so uh, let's, let's look at, uh, at what sort of happens on a daily basis when we write code. So yeah. Uh, I'm no PowerPoint wizard, so it all just shows at once. Uh, so let's say there's a programmer, we could call him Anos, or A. Uh, he writes some function, foo. Uh, the foo takes some number of arguments, uh, so he writes out, maybe it looks like this. Uh, maybe there are three arguments. He likes to call them mat1, mat2, and some strings. And A makes certain assumptions as to... Uh, as to what those arguments should be. Uh, so he has some ideas in his head. Uh, what, are the, what are my arguments to my functions? Then he, of course, he's a good programmer. He documents his assumption. So he writes some comments or arg should be blah, blah. Uh, then another programmer comes along. Maybe he's called Ken. Let's just call him K for short. Uh, so he writes another function, bar. And he wants to call foo. So he writes this function call, foo, and applies some arguments. Then K. It reads, of course, the documentation and figures out, okay, there should be three arguments. What sort of should they be? And, uh, and, and figures it out and writes it. And, I mean, he also tests it and it appears to work and so on. Uh, so all is well and good, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. So the, what can go wrong? So first of all, we have, we have some sort of, I mean, down, down in the, uh, context of foo, there, this, all of these assumptions are present implicitly in the way that the arguments are used. Uh, they're of course documented in the header, but only to a certain extent, right? Because A has his assumptions in his head, and then there's a translation going on when he writes it down as, as words. 
uh, in the documentation. So something can be missed out, something can be misinterpreted, so on. There's another translation going on when K reads the documentation of Fu and tries to understand what did, what did A mean when he wrote that. Uh, and test might catch some of this, it might, uh, might not. Um, and then there's the entire problem related to, to maintenance. So we are going to need to update foo, and we are also going to need to update bar. Both functions along the line, uh, lifeline of the product, they will need some updates. And whenever we make updates, maybe the assumptions change. So what then needs to happen? We need to make a sort of coordinated, synchronous update in three places, right? We need to update foo, and we need to update bar accordingly, and we need to update the documentation to make sure, but that, but that was just some comment, right? It was written down, it's easy to forget. So all of this maintenance cycle, as we heard earlier, it introduces entropy, and at some point it's likely to, something is going to go wrong, and we introduce bugs. Um, the solution that we've come up with at SimCorp is, uh, to introduce uh, a formal language for writing down those assumptions so that it can be machine checkable uh, and verified that, that what you're assuming about your arguments is actually true and the other programmer who calls your function actually supplies something that matches those assumptions. So we introduce variable types as could, could look like this. So we introduce a header uh, that has sort of a certain structure. And here's an example, vt int and then square bracket and uh, semicolon here to indicate this is, should be an integer matrix. Uh, so the first, first of all, there should be like, arc should be a vector of length three. First element should be an integer matrix. S something interesting here in the next line perhaps. Uh, Mat 2 should also be an integer matrix, and the first dimension should be the same as the first dimension of mat 1. Second dimension should be the same as the second dimension of mat 1. So it should have the same shape. We can even express that. Maybe string should be a vector of vectors of uh, characters. Uh, so all of this is suddenly very, very precise, and maybe in the written documentation that was before, it said something, it should be a matrix of numbers, a matrix of numbers. Maybe the shape assumption was accidentally left out or someone made bad assumptions about, well, how do you pass in a number of strings? Should it be in a matrix or what shape should it be? Um, but now with this header language, with these uh, variable types, it all becomes completely explicit. Uh, and when those assumptions change, you're also forced to change the header to match it. So you automatically make sure that your documentation is up to date. Uh, and all of this, then we have a uh, static analysis tool on top to verify that all of these assumptions are correct. Um, so um, what the static analysis does, it does three checks, right? Remember, for the updates, we needed to do three synchronous uh, updates to maintain the code. The checker performs, uh, in the same way, three checks. It checks the header specification, right? Does this make sense, what you wrote here? Is this actually uh, a valid according to our language for, for variable types? Then it checks the function foo against this assumption. So it checks all this code that you wrote here in the in the body of foo, does it actually, the way that you're using the arguments, does it match up with the assumptions that you gave? If not, you'll get an error and you're not allowed to check it into the repository. So if you may suddenly make a change and you accidentally think that strings was a character matrix instead, then whoops, the tool will tell you, no, that's not the case because you wrote up here that it was vector of vector of characters. So you're not allowed to check in. Similarly, if you make a call to another place, it will check that the arguments you supply match what's written here. 
This is also a great tool for, for refactoring because then when you do any sort of change, the tool will make sure that you change all three places at once and that it matches up. Uh, the first tool like this was introduced uh, in SimCorp 10 years ago. Uh, worked quite well. I think uh, I didn't work for the company back then, but uh, I'm told that basically all value errors in customer code vanished overnight. So no more value errors at customers. Uh, there were also some, some, some flaws. I mean, it didn't find anything, uh, everything. But uh, so recently we've uh, acknowledged that we needed some update in this area. So basically, yeah, I, I rewrote this, uh, the tool from scratch. Uh, it's sort of like writing an APL interpreter. Uh, and quite, quite a lot of uh, interesting challenges in there. And one of them was passing, passing APL. Uh, it's currently 8,000 lines of F sharp and uh, 500 lines of uh, FS Lex, Lex and Yak code. Um, so, so regarding parsing, maybe I should say for lexing and parsing, I don't know if everybody's uh, familiar with the terminology. So slide aside, lexing parsing 101. Uh, lexing is the part where you start off with your function that's just a string. Lexing then chops off the string into a sequence of tokens typically accomplished with regular expressions, but it's still sort of a linear structure. So it says APL symbol this, identifier this, APL symbol this, and so on, but still just a linear structure. Passing um, is then the process of taking that vector of tokens now uh, and giving it a sort of a, a more structure, like a tree structure saying, well, this this if belongs with this end if, so you actually get all the parenthetical structure and you get for the expressions, you get, the, well, this is actually a dyadic application of this function to this argument. So you get the entire structure of the code represented in data structures. And then after that, you can start to do your analysis on the code. So that's lexing and parsing. They're standard tools for, for deriving lexes and parses. Um, so since uh, this static uh, checker needs to, needs to look for, for bugs in your code, it needs to understand all the APL symbols, all the control flow constructs to figure out that you're actually using the va variables according to the specification that you wrote in the header. And, and the new ones, I mean, the old one worked quite well. The new one tries to do a lot more. Uh, one of my hopes is that, well, the old one removed all the value errors. I think the new one has the potential to remove all the rank errors. I think when we finish rolling it out in the company, there will be no more rank errors at customers. It can also do a lot with length errors and domain errors and stuff like that. I'm not claiming we will go down to zero errors at customers, but uh, I think we'll catch a lot more before it hits customers. Uh, so, sort of uh, bringing up a sort of real-life example. So this is uh, this is production code. This is code that has been shipped to to customers and it's running. Uh, there's a utility function for doing some updates in some strings, um, and it's specified with a header. You see here, this is the left document. It should be either. So this this either or. So it works on different shapes of data, should either be a string, string here is short for just character array, or sort of a vector of strings. And then some additional text to comment this. And the right argument should be a string or a character matrix. And the output is going to be a string or a character matrix. Okay, excellent. We have this and it's checked uh, that the use of y and x matches this and that the result we end up supplying also matches the output. Excellent, and here's, here's a call where it's actually used in another function. So, uh, and here's one of the cases. So, so this, was, this was written uh, and, 
and commit it, but now the check can figure out, well, this actually you made a mistake here, right? Because this is just a single space, and here's just a single character. So that's actually a scalar. So maybe the programmer who wrote this didn't account for for x and y for y being a scalar. He certainly didn't write it. So maybe he forgot about it here. So this is flagged as an error because either it's going to be wrong to supply a scalar because the function wasn't intended that way, or maybe it was intended to take a scalar and then was forgotten to be documented. That's also an error. Uh, maybe test, it, test didn't catch it because he accidentally, well, or fortunately in the way he wrote it, it happened to handle the scalar case. But maybe someone then comes along and does some refactoring or updates and sort of reads the header and say, oh, this is the case I should account for. And well, then suddenly it doesn't handle the scalar case anymore. So it's important. This is flagged as an error. And, and the tool, tool will ca catch this and tell you this. So, yeah. So, yeah. This is, uh, yeah. So, yeah. This is one of the piece of code I took directly from, uh, from our production. Uh, so, so how do we, uh, how do we go about writing such, such a tool to analyze APL? Um, the thing is, um, I started sort of when starting this project, uh, sort of looking for articles, right? There must be someone who's written something about passing APL and I found something, yeah. APL is uh, unpassable, <laughs> cannot be done. There was even a proof, I think, in a paper somewhere I read. Uh, yeah, cannot be done. All right, let's just give up then, right? Nah, let's uh, see, okay, well, maybe in general, in its full generality, with all of the quirks and twists, APL is un unpassable. But, I mean, we can make sort of very, very minor restrictions, and then maybe we can get something to work. So, with only like very, very few minor restrictions, uh, I actually managed to come up with a complete grammar describing the entire APL language. Um, it's very nice declarative, just says an expression can be this or this or this. And since it's written in standard notation in BNF, we can use standard tools uh, like uh, YAC, which will then auto-generate a parser for us. Uh, so, so this is also, so when Dialog in version 14 introduced some new symbols, we just add it to the grammar and voila, we run the parser generator again and we get the new parser. Um, and the thing is, these tools, when, when it's written in a BNF, we get a very, very efficient parser. It's so-called LALR1 parser. That means that it's, uh, it goes from left to right, and it only uses one token look ahead. So it just looks at the token stream and looks at the next token, and then can decide in constant time what to do, and goes on to the next token. So it never, looks at, it never does any backtracking or any sort of stuff like that. It just goes linearly through the code, and then it has a complete pass tree. Um, so, so what's what's the trouble, right? Let's uh, let's see what what is it that it's actually doing with passing. So here's a tiny APL expression, x slash each y. You might think, okay, uh, can we pass this? So, and what does a pass tree look like? What is what is the result of passing? Um, actually, for this one, there are two options. So this is one of the cases that, uh, that are problematic in the sense that, well, APL cannot be passed because there's not a unique solution to this. It depends, right? It depends on what x is. Is x an array or is x a function? So if x turns out to be a function, then this is a monadic application where the right argument to, to the function is the array variable y, and the function itself is the result of an operator application, that operator is each, that operator applies to the function that is the result of another operator application, which is reduce, 
that is applied to the function variable x. So we get this nice tree structure that captures all the information about what is actually going on in this expression. And if x had been an array variable instead, the pass tree would look like this. Then it would be a dyadic application between the array variables x and y on each side. And the function would be the result of the operator application of each to the function replicate. Um, but with this information, when we know that y is a variable, uh, an array variable, and x is an array variable, then we can get a unique pass tree. So values come in three kinds. We have arrays, we have functions, and we have operators. And I say three kinds because they, they're the ones who influence uh, the result of passing, because they, they behave in different ways in terms of how we mentally, when we look at an expression, how we mentally put those parentheses in the expression. Uh, when we have sequences of arrays, they form vectors and functions. They associate to the right. If we have several functions, right? We start from the right to put the parentheses. Operators are the other way around. They associate to the left. If we have a bunch of operators, we mentally put the parentheses around the left. And, and parsing needs this information. So we need complete kind information of all the constituents of an, of an expression to be able to do parsing. And, and this is sort of the tricky part. So, so what I've come up with is that if we separate parsing in, in two steps, so cut it, cut it in half, and then sandwich a kind inference algorithm in between, then we can actually do this. So, so the first step of parsing is all the control flow, because ifs and end ifs and while until, all that stuff, that's pretty easy. That's, uh, that can all be matched up, and we also pass all the parentheses to make sure all of those match up. So we get sort of token trees. Then when we have these uh, token trees that represent the expressions, we can do a kind of inference, figure out how all the constituents, are they arrays, are they functions, are they operators? And then we can ship these token trees uh, with kind of inference back into the, the parser, and we get the, the parse trees out that the tool can then analyze for errors. So how does this kind of inference work? Um, naturally proceeds from left to right. We can consider sort of x dot y. Well, we need to know if x is a namespace or a function first before figuring out whether the dot is an operator or a namespace index. Similarly here, to figure out what the slash is, we need to know what the x is. For the square brackets, is that an axis or is that uh, uh, an array index? Again, starting from left to right. So what it does is the left to right depth first scan. Uh, individual tokens, well, uh, when we know what's to the left of it, we can infer that kind, their kind. And when we then have parenthesized expressions, we get the compound count kind of the entire parenthesized expression by uh, uh, combining the kind of all, all the tokens uh, lined up after each other. And then we tag all the tokens uh, and all the left parentheses with the compound kind they close, and then ship that back into the uh, the, the parser. Uh, so this is sort of the bulk of the kind inference algorithm. Uh, so yeah, uh, has uh, when it works on a sequence of kinds. You can do rewrites to figure out, let's say you have an array followed by a function, followed by some more stuff. Then you know that that entire sequence of things will end up being an array. It can never be a function because there's the left argument supplied. Uh, and if there's an array dot something with a namespace index, so we can just drop that and continue with those kinds. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of cases. Um, yeah, some special cases for outer product and so on. But that basically means that uh, we can sort of bottom up, we can get the kind of every single token. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I thought I'd show sort of part of the BNF grammar for, for APL. Um, so we give this, this is standard BNF notation. So uh, an expression can here be three different things, and I'm marked here. This, this is the part where we can see that, for instance, uh, functions associate to the right, because we have the right recursion. So an expression can be a vector followed by a function followed by another expression. So if you sort of consider that being expanded, that expression can again be a vector followed by a function followed by an expression. That's quite clean specification here, and over here on the right we have the F sharp code that then generate the, the tree, the pass tree. And similarly for functions down here, we can see function and then dyadic operator that applies to two functions, and then a simple function, which is not one of these compound functions. And again, we have the recursion here. It says func here uh, that returns to this part. On the left-hand side, so we see that this encodes that uh, operators associate to the left. And when you plug this into, uh, into standard tools like YAC, it comes out and says, if you do it right, it comes out and says, well, zero conflicts, uh, zero ambiguities, and then you know that it will uh, generate complete pass trees for all of APL. Um, so, yeah, this, yeah, I can't show all of it, but this is just sort of a tiny piece of the BNF grammar for all of AP, APL. So, so the analysis tool contains all of it. Now, that was uh, for the Lexon parser code, that's about 500 lines of specification. So this, there was also, I mentioned some, some restrictions, some fine print. Uh, so what were those? Uh, and it's basically, it basically boils down to, since we need to know the kind, whether something is an array or a function, we need to make sort of a tiny restriction on defined operators. So they need a static description of their left operand and right operand uh, to say whether that is an array or a function. So that tiny restriction is that we do not allow defined operators to sometime take a left operand that is a function and sometimes an array. Because that would, that would, if you remember back to those pass trees, right, that would then at runtime generate different pass trees. And we want to, at analysis time, figure out what is the pass tree. Um, and we also need an environment to describe all global variables and functions to say what, basically what are their headers. Uh, I mean, we need the headers to, to check for errors anyway, so that also contains for all the global variables and functions and operators exactly that, whether it's an array or a function or an operator. So when we see just an identifier, we just look up in the context and say, oh, that's a function, ship that into the kind inference, and off we go with parsing and we get the parse tree. That's my not quirk, but that's more likely a in APL, but that's, yeah. Um, and I think that was basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, questions? Or maybe I'll, st I'll start off with a question for you. Um, so, of course, many of you, when you do your development, you obviously do some unit testing and so on. Uh, any of you doing any sort of automated quality assurance beside unit testing? Yes, there's one, uh, one, a few. Doing some static analysis, all right, cool. Oh, all right, on with the questions. Uh, I learned yesterday, or Sunday, uh, 16 IBAR can reveal the actual internal type of an anything in APL. Uh, can John Daintree verify that statement? But that's is that can can that be used here 
that's only when the variable has actually taken a value. Remember, this analyzes the function without running any code. So when it determines that this variable is going to be at runtime a matrix with this and this shape, the variable doesn't exist in the workspace yet. It has no value. So you cannot ask APL, what is this? Because it's going to be constructed at runtime inside a loop, inside deeply nested. And, and actually constructing it may require running hours of uh, business-specific code with data coming in from customers and whatnot. So, so sure, at runtime, APL will be able to pinpoint exactly what is the type of something. The trick is doing it statically up front just by looking at the code. I take it that as of yet, you're not supporting function trains. Are you having any plans to support that in the future? Yeah, uh, I should think that should be a few hours of coding. Then I should be up and running with function trains. How many, um, let's say, how general is your syntax for defining Variable argument types? types? Um, quite, quite general. I think, I mean, it's evolved over time. We've been using this for 10 years, so it covers covers basically our needs. It's, uh, I mean, you have the basic APL data types. You can define that it's vectors or matrices. Uh, you can say that it's either this or that. Uh, recently, I introduced uh, polymorphism, that is generics in the same type that you have in Java or C Sharp, that you say that the input type is equal to the output type. So you can make some general function that reshuffles data without knowing what the data is. And then you can declare that the input type should be equal to the output type. But it could be any. But any type, yeah. Um, we have business specific types that are implemented as integers, but treated differently by the type system, saying you are not really allowed to treat this as an integer because it's just a marker saying that it refers to something. So you're not allowed to sort of use it as an integer. You should only use it for comparison. So it would be sort of a, a business mistake to treat it as, uh, as anything other than a constant value. So you can compare it to others of the same kind. So uh, yeah, we have quite an, quite an extensive uh, uh, what you say about, about types is very important, not just for static analysis and proving, uh, detecting certain classes of errors, but also it, uh, particularly if you use stuff like dependent types as Kai Trahaner and other have, you end up uh, offering uh, compilers an opportunity to conduct optimizations that were otherwise very difficult to, yep. to observe. So I, you know, I think this, this is, this is power, powerful stuff both for the developer and for uh, performance-related reasons. Yeah. I actually talked to uh, Jay from uh, Dialog about this regarding the Dialog compiler project. And we discussed uh, that there would be, I think, some sort of uh, callback function from the compiler. So when the compiler would want more information about the stuff that it compiles, it could ask a callback function. And then we could plug this in there to compile more stuff. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking um, you declare data as integers and probably also as decimals. Yep. Um, do you check that no operation is taking place that can change an integer to a decimal? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when the analysis run through, if you take an integer and you divide it by another integer, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. says, well, the result is then a double uh, floating point number. And then if you take... Uh, take the flaw of that, you end up back with an integer, and so on. So it knows all the semantics of all the APL operations and will thread that through. And you can also ask the tool, sort of, uh, during your static analysis, what is your knowledge about this variable? And then it would tell you as output, well, it starts off as an integer, and then you assign the matrix. And then in this loop, it stabilizes as started off as either 0 or 1. or But then you do this loop, and then at first it's becomes this something else, and then it stabilizes as blah, and in the end it's this. So you can ask it that, and then we'll provide you with a sort of statically computed trace of the variable what it, over its lifetime in the function, what it can be. 
What does SIM card do with all these 68,000 uh, <laughs> things? Uh, I mean, it's a portfolio manager. What's your function? I mean, what does SIM card do? I guess that's... We do uh, portfolio management software. Mm -hmm. So end-to-end, uh, -end, some trader in a bank punches in a transaction. I want to trade this bond or whatever and goes through compliance and limit checks and uh, risk analysis and goes to bookkeeping and reporting and uh, yeah, okay. huge system. Just a quick thing. You're almost there with the rank error detection stuff. The yep. place where it falls apart, unless you're very careful, is uh, a deficiency in APL uh, semantics where having to do with treatment of singletons. And uh, if you have a singleton like 111 one, reshape 2 yep. plus vector, then the rank of the result depends on the length of the vector. So this, this is a fault in, a, in the design of APL that goes back to the dark ages. It was repaired <laughs> in J, and um, you know, it, it, it requires yep. special it's, work. And I got, I got rid of, in the Apex compiler uh, that I wrote, I, got ri I eliminated that thing just by uh, making it illegal, just like in J. Um, and at that point, I claimed that the static, an I, you know, static analysis along the same lines you did, eliminates all rank errors, all type errors, mm. some domain errors, and some length errors. Yeah, I mean, we do, as you saw in the types uh, for the function, that it could be either this type or that type. So it does support working with sort of almost known rank, saying it's this rank or that rank. So it maintains as precise information as possible at all points. Yeah, you mentioned you have 215 developers. Yep. Um, how many testers do you have? How many testers do we have? Someone help me out. There are plenty of SIM covers here. 70. <laughs> Se seven, 70? 70. Yeah, also. For C sharp and APL. And the, 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 uh, the primitive composition operator, JOT, can yep. take an array or function left yep. operand. Does that cause you a problem? No, not at all. Works perfectly fine. It's uh, all in uh, described in the BNF. There it says basically that Jot, uh, if you go down, then, then you see. No, jot is you, separate. Okay, jot, I, didn't I, spot I take, it. take out Jot separate mostly because it's part of uh, uh, this, this construct here where you do outer product. So, so we need to sort of. So Jot just gets it, uh, its own terminal in the BNF. When the code makes external calls via coordinate or dot net calls, um, uh, how do yep. you cope with the results? Good question. What we do is we have a lots of uh, external libraries for various financial calculations written in C, stuff like that. Uh, all those external points are then defined in sort of an encapsulated uh, manner, and then we have a complete table saying that these specific function calls have these interfaces. So we basically have written headers uh, in the same way as for regular APL functions for those external calls as well. Obviously, we cannot check that the external calls match up to these headers, so you just have to code review them and make sure they're right. But we can check the calls that APL programmers make to those external calls that they match up with what uh, is prescribed by the interface and that you're using the result that you get back in the right way. So yeah, we just add headers to type descriptions to those as well. Do you have some statistics on your BNF grammar, the number of productions, the... Um, I think around 400 productions, 400 something-ish productions. So... Uh, this this line here is a production. So, yep. Yeah, so so this is here's three productions, two more, three more, so on. It's yeah, a technical term from uh, BNF. So, yeah, tells you yeah the length. So so basically, this has 400 lines like this ish, give or take. I think uh, yeah, we're 
approaching lunch. Also, I think uh, if anyone wants to see a live demo of this, I'll, I'll be heading home tonight, but I think several of my colleagues probably have a laptop with them and can do sort of offline in the breaks uh, demos of this tool, if anyone's interested in that. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you.